Hypoxemia is something that I deal with quite frequently during anesthesia and often it's an unexpected complication for me. So I'm excited to talk about it. So in order to dive into the depths of hypoxemia a little bit, I'm going to use this dog as a case example. His name is Benson and he is a six-year-old intact male mixed breed dog who was recently adopted by his new family. He's healthy. He's a big dog, about 60 pounds, 27 kilograms, and he's presented for castration. His physical exam is really pretty, unexciting. He's a very, very sweet dog. He does have a little bit of dental disease. For pre-medication, he received an alpha-2 agonist and a full mu agonist opioid intramuscularly. Once he was settled down, he got an IV catheter placed, and he was induced with ketamine and propofol, IV to effect and then maintained on isoflurane. Right after being prepped, which, you know, all this is pretty quick for castration, he received an intratesticular local anesthetic block with bupivacaine. This is the anesthesia record for Benson. As you can see in the first reading, which is pretty much immediately after induction, everything was fairly normal. So the pulse ox reading is a right side up triangle. You can see it was right around 100. Shortly thereafter, however, the technician noted a change in the tone of the pulse oximetry monitor, and the reading given by the pulse oximeter rapidly dropped to 76%. So what's the best response to a low pulse oximetry reading? What should you do? Check the patient, and that is probably one of the safest things you can say to an anesthesiologist if something's going wrong. Actually, even when things are going right, you should keep your hands and eyes and ears on the patient at all times. So what I do in my head is try to divide the causes into those that are equipment-based and those that are patient issues. Just like some people will do their physical exams from head to tail and some people do tail to head or start on the pause, I like to always do the same thing. So I start at the machine and work toward the patient. I'm going to quickly check the oxygen line pressure and supply. If I have an inspired oxygen monitor, I'm going to look at what the percentage of oxygen being inspired is. I'm going to make sure the flow meter moves. Check that quickly. It could get stuck on, and you think that, that oxygen is flowing when it is really not. I'm going to look quickly at the connections to and from the vaporizer, and I'm going to make sure I have the correct anesthesia circuit. Occasionally, if you're switching frequently between non-rebreathers and circle systems, it's possible to have the anesthesia machine disconnected at the fresh gas outlet hooked up to the non-rebreather, but the circle system's hooked up to the CO2 absorber and you've hooked that up to the patient. That is a not uncommon cause of hypoxemia and potentially death. Once I've established that the machine and all of those parts are functional and working as I would expect them, I'm going to look at my anesthetic monitor on the way to looking at my patient again. I'm going to look for intidal carbon dioxide concentration, assuming that I have a capnometer. That's going to tell me that the lungs are being perfused, gas exchange is happening, the endotracheal tube is in the right place and it is not obstructed, and the animal is breathing. In capnometry tells you a lot about the differentials for hypoxemia, and it can also tell you about potential causes of hypoxemia before hypoxemia develops. It can be an early warning system, and that's, that's really nice. If I have the inspired oxygen monitor, I'm going to look at that, and then I'm going to look overall at the cardiovascular system, blood pressure, heart rate, and rhythm. I might have a very different approach to my next step if his heart rate is 25 versus 125. This is just a normal capnogram from a spontaneously breathing animal. At this point, I've checked the machine. I looked quickly at the anesthesia monitor to ascertain that intidal carbon dioxide is present and that my inspired oxygen concentration is fine and my animal is not about to collapse cardiovascularly. I'm going to hand ventilate the patient. I want to know if this is qualitatively normal. Does it feel very hard to ventilate? Is it super easy and maybe there's a disconnection that I haven't detected yet because it's super easy to push all the air out into the atmosphere? Does the chest move when I ventilate the animal? Again, look for intidal CO2. If I ventilated the animal and carbon dioxide came out, again, the lungs are being perfused, the endotracheal tube's in place, it's not obstructed. 
Then I'm going to pass the ventilation off to somebody else, and I'm going to listen to both sides of the chest. I'm going to listen for lung sounds and make sure there aren't any crackles or it's very quiet. At this point, you sort of have to decide, is this a situation I can move forward with and maybe do take some radiographs or do an arterial blood gas and try to ferret out what's going on, or do I need to stop and wake this patient up? And sometimes, depending on your clinical resources and clinical setting, it may be best to regroup and try again another day. So by doing all these things, starting at the machine and working toward the patient, we've ruled out almost all the potential causes of hypoxemia under anesthesia. And then to rule out an abnormal hemoglobin, if you've established that everything else is normal, you have to get an arterial blood gas. So Benson, quickly checking the O2 supply and machine and circuit. Everything there is fine. His blood pressure was normal. His heart rate was normal. His entitled CO2 was normal at 37 with a normal looking waveform. And ventilating him felt normal but his breath sounds are a little hard to hear on the left, normal breath sounds on the right. So this radiograph was taken of Benson. We have a left lateral of his thorax. Based on the information you have, which of the following is the most likely cause of hypoxemia in Benson? A, ventilation perfusion mismatch due to aspiration pneumonia. B, anatomic shunt due to undetected congenital heart problem. C, decreased partial pressure of inspired oxygen due to endotracheal tube obstruction. D, VQ mismatch due to pleural effusion. Or E, intrapulmonary shunt due to endobronchial intubation. So the answer here is intrapulmonary shunt due to endobronchial intubation. And if you look at this film, you can see that that endotracheal tube is quite far in. You can see some air bronchograms here because what has happened is the tip of the endotracheal tube is moved into one side, one lung, so maybe the left lung, and then the right side is completely collapsed. Endotracheal tubes can move, of course, especially if you're moving the patient. And the fact that everything else looked pretty normal, the machine looked normal, there was entitled CO2, so the animal was still intubated and the tube wasn't obstructed, the waveform looked normal, but I couldn't hear lung sounds on the left made me suspect that endobronchial intubation was the cause. And so then you've got a whole set of lungs, so the whole side of the lungs that is not ventilated, but perfusion to that lung is normal. And so it's kind of like mixing hot water with lukewarm water. You get sort of halfway in between, and so then uh, oxygen concentration goes down quite a bit. 